Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Plant Cunning Podcast. Today we have herbalist and author Lucy Jones on the show, and it's a wonderful conversation. I'm sure you're going to love it. Before we get to it, I just want to remind folks that we are having a in-person conference here at our farm in central New York on September 9th and 10th. And if you would like to come, you can follow the link below to get your early bird tickets. Those are going to go up in price in July. So make sure you get them now, because there are also only a limited number of tickets available. Okay, here's Lucy. We're very excited today to welcome Lucy Jones to the Plant Cunning Podcast. Hi, Lucy. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. Very excited to be here. Yes, it's so exciting to have you. I was just mentioning in the pre-chat that I've been following your journey on Instagram and I've been reading your books. Well, your first book, you just read another book, which you're really excited to dive into. And so it's a real honor and joy to get to actually just chat with you today. So, Oh, it's mutual. So you're an author and you're an herbalist. We have a traditional first question on the Plant Cunning Podcast, and it's how did you come to the plant path? So you want to start there we'd love to hear great and you know I'm really glad I had I had an idea that you might ask me that and I it it made me think about it and what I actually realized is that I do have an answer kind of like you know how I came to to study and all of that which I will go into but I realized that looking back it might sound a bit weird we just think I was always on that because I was always on the plant path in a way, because I'm thinking like my earliest memories as a little kid, you know, I was always in the garden, you know, with the plants, really fascinated. And I just think probably, although it depends how you define the plant path, doesn't it? But I just feel like in a way, without wanting to sound too, I don't know what the word would be, you know, I just feel like I was always on it, you know, practically. Yeah. Maybe not from birth, but, you know, as soon as I was old enough to get outside, you know, I just knew that I wanted to work with plants and maybe I didn't know the exact form that that would take. But, yeah, I think you could say they called to me Mm. or they ordered me. I don't know, but I'm so happy that that happened. And so to answer your question properly. (laughs) um, Yeah. How do I answer that properly? Well, I think I always wanted to work with plants as I've just said but I was maybe a bit reticent about going down the medical herbalist route even though it's what I really wanted to do when I was younger it I think that I was quite academic and I think there was some sort of pressure that I felt that maybe you know I should have a more I don't know, conventional sort of career or something like that. But in my spare time, I was just really obsessed with herbs. And when I remember actually, when I was at secondary school, we had this system where if you won the the class prize, you would get a book token. And then, you know, you could choose what book you had. And it, I think there was a kind of unwritten understanding that it was going to be something like the Oxford English Dictionary or Shakespeare or something. And I chose a herbal. (laughs) So I think I was always kind of really drawn to it. But when it came down to it, I I studied agriculture and forestry to start with. That's so cool. uh, which I really loved. It was so fascinating to learn about the growing side and, you know, soil science and all of that. I absolutely loved it and worked as a consultant for quite a while. But just the whole idea of herbal therapeutics, you know, all I ever wanted to do was just grow medicinal herbs and mm-hmm. make stuff out of them. And so I think it was just an inevitable thing. And so there came a point when when I'd been doing environmental consultancy for quite a while, which was quite a pressurized sort of job, which I also love. But there kind of came a point where you think, no, I'm I really am going to pursue my passion instead of doing something that interests me and I enjoy. But I just felt this sort of destiny. And, And at that time, 
my my spiritual teacher I'm a Tibetan Buddhist and I met my spiritual teacher Akon Rinpoche in 1993 and at that time there was this very exciting proposal going on where a Tibetan master was going to be brought over from Tibet a very high medicinal teacher a professor and lineage holder called Kempo Truro Tsenam and it was a really amazing opportunity where a small group of Westerners were going to be taught the entire transmission of the Tibetan medicinal teachings. And, and we were very lucky because although all the teaching was going to be in Tibetan, it was, you know, it was going to be, we were going to have access to translators and it was all really amazing. But it was, the course was very limited. You, you couldn't just join. And it was designed for people that were already working in a healthcare modality. So there were, you know, there were a couple of GPs, midwives, there were Reiki practitioners, Chinese medicine people, you know, all like across the board of people that were involved in healing. And there was me like, no, I'm an environmental consultant. Wow. <laughs> I wasn't involved in healing, but I'm like, wow, did I really want to be on that course? So I asked my spiritual teacher, like, oh, please, can I join the course? And he said, no. <laughs> so I was really a bit like, oh, this isn't how <laughs> Oh, I really want to do it. So I thought, oh, OK, well, I was a bit gutted. I don't know. I, I thought that because it felt like I should do it, you know, maybe I asked in a way that perhaps wasn't. I don't know. Who knows? But anyway, he said no. And then about maybe a month later, I requested another interview with him. And I just said, look, I really, you know, I'm really asking. I really like to join the course. I feel that, you know, I, it would be really a great thing to do. And I'm very passionate about it. And please, will you let me join the course? And he said, no. Oh. <laughs> um, I can't tell you how gutting that was because it just felt so, the more that it, I wasn't able to do it, the more I felt like, I know that I'm meant to do this course. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just have this huge burning sort of thing. And also as a side issue, I'd met another Lama, a very amazing Lama. And I had asked him to do a divination about whether or not I should study Tibetan medicine. And he, it was a whole, don't worry, I won't go into it, but it was a whole amazing experience. And he'd sort of done this divination. He said, you're deaf, you should definitely study Tibetan medicine and you should definitely give up your job and do it. Yeah. So having, I think because he'd said that, I was thinking like, yeah, I mean, this is how the story goes, you know, like he's done that divination. He thinks that I should do it. So therefore surely like I'm gonna be able to do the course and it will all work out. But there was this, no so, yeah. so I thought well maybe maybe I'm not supposed to do that course maybe I'm supposed to do another one but finally I've been reading some very Tibetan stories and you know folklore and, and tradition about saints and there's a, there is a big tradition about asking three times and showing you know real commitment and I sort of thought maybe this is it maybe you know Maybe I need to ask a third time. Yes. <laughs> so I, I, and it was really quite nerve wracking because I, I also decided that, of course, if he says no again, that's it. I'm not going to embarrass myself, you know, by doing it or, or put him to that trouble. So I'm going to ask the final time, the third time. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and I was so scared that you know oh. what was going to happen so I went in and I asked and I just said you know I talked about how it just felt like my destiny I felt like that I needed to work <clears throat> with the plants in this way I felt so drawn to it and I understood what an incredible opportunity it was to learn with this great master and that I'd really appreciated that and that I would do anything if I would be allowed to do it because I felt so strongly about it. And he said, well, <laughs> he said, you could join the course if you commit to studying and qualifying as a Western herbalist when you finish the course. So that was a four year course already. And then it, to become a West, a registered medical herbalist in the West was 
for me, it was a six year journey. But he said, you could do that if you if you commit to, to qualifying as a herbalist and if you then commit to putting that knowledge together so that you can open a clinic that combines Tibetan medicine with Western herbal medicine. And if you commit to that, I will let you do the course. And here I am. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so you're sitting in your herbal apothecary dispensary now? Yeah. And this is why it's called Mirobolan Clinic, because Mirobolan is the one of the, well, it's really the most sacred herb in the Tibetan pharmacopoeia. And I wanted, although no one can pronounce it, I don't mind. <laughs> I just wanted something that reflected that link because I am pretty much really working as a Western herbalist. I'm never going to say that I'm a Tibetan doctor, but I, but the aim of this teaching that this few group of Westerners went through, a few, that's not the right grammar, but you know what I mean. The aim was so that we could bring the principles of Tibetan medicine and all of that incredible wisdom into a sort of a Western modality and be able to influence the work in a way. And I think I really, of course, I'm going to say this, but I think that it is a very beautiful combination. Mm. So yeah, and and I'm I'm sitting here and I'm so happy that I've been able to fulfill that commitment. <laughs> but it was quite a lot of studying. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. What was studying with Kempo Truro Sanam like? Like, what was he like? It was really amazing. I think we we were reminded at the beginning of every session that, you know, we weren't just there to learn what he was teaching us. He said, before you, before we start this today's session, I want you to visualize that every word that I say and every piece of knowledge that you gain I'm paraphrasing but you know it will be for the benefit of all beings and that you can place yourself into that kind of state of learning for that benefit you know and it, it was so it was all it was a very yeah it was a really amazing experience it was very friendly and relaxed as well but we were really conscious of it wasn't just a, a lecture and you know just taking notes it was like this kind of incredibly important transmission really of much more than just you know what was on the page I suppose it really was an amazing I think I, I only really appreciated how amazing it was as time went on, probably. I mean, you know, human nature, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and also maybe comparing it to then your training as a Western herbalist. I, I wonder how that integration was for you. Like, because I, I, I see this happening. Like, I'm studying Vedic astrology now because I've okay. been studying Western. And it's it's very different in, in Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine and traditional Tibetan medicine. There, it's there's a cohesiveness and there's an underlying spiritual viewpoint that we don't have in the in the West because mm -hmm. our traditions have been, you know, destroyed for the most part. And we're, we're rebuilding them now, but I think having that perspective can be very helpful in navigating th this reconstruction and, and revitalization of the Western traditions. But so, how how was your experience with that, with with navigating that, and the you know differences between the systems? Yeah, I mean, well. There's different aspects to that question, but I think, um, firstly, I, I, I was going, going into the Western studies as being a different subject, you know, that I'm learning this and then I will be, you know, be able, hopefully, it, to integrate it in some way, maybe I didn't know at the time. And I, but I think that at the very beginning, I was quite keen to find a way of understanding the western information in terms of the old galenical humors and things like that i thought you know maybe there'll be some crossover and i can kind of understand it but no <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't it doesn't work you know the the humors just don't match 
mm. are yeah. with the Tibetan ones. And so after years of trying to sort of, yeah, well, you know, sanguine is, is moist and this, but in Tibetan medicine, air is dry. And, you know, and I, I thought, but, you know, maybe you can. And then I realized, just forget that. It's a different system. I was getting so I was tying myself in knots trying to make them fit yeah <laughs> and what what I realize now is that it's all about I mean I I will admit that when I see a patient I am probably primarily looking at them in terms of Tibetan medicine in terms of their health narrative in terms of the humors and the elements because it's just so deeply taught you know that so I'm going to look at them on that on look at a patient on that kind of elemental level mm. but then also look at them on a western more kind of maybe you know diagnostic type level you know what's the system what what physiological actions are needed and for that I much more have a tendency to work with the western herbs but it's just this I think it really works well because when you're talking to patients about elemental balances and, you know, well, in Tibetan medicine, I would consider your case to be one of the air humor being in excess. And that means this, that and the other. And people really get it because it, it's, a, it's a really simple sort of narrative and it just makes a lot of sense. And also particularly when people have not had answers from their allopathic practitioners and they're told, oh, just take antidepressants, you know, you're anxious or something. And it's it's just really helpful if you can explain why the air humor, the types of behaviors that have led to the air humor becoming in excess, you know, that person's been drinking a lot of green smoothies and having a lot of raw food and eating irregularly and not sleeping properly and you know all of that has led to this kind of lack of groundedness and you know that the person can really see that and they can see like hey yeah I'm I don't necessarily I'm not being dismissive about antidepressants by the way can I just say that some people need them and that's fine please don't not have them if you need them <laughs> but but you know there are it is it is that stock kind of thing isn't it oh uh, that, that a doctor may say if they don't really know what's wrong with someone and I think that to empower a patient that they understand that they maybe need to change their lifestyle change their diet eat more regularly eat more nourishing foods go to bed a bit earlier you know all of that can work wonders alongside a western prescription mm -hmm. I'm very passionate about it yeah yeah totally this did you have a question or? Well, it just, I, I think it's an important point though, it, when you're learning these, the systems is that they're kind of like languages yeah. and you, you can't just mix and match them, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, but once you master each language, you can integrate them in a different sort of way. <laughs> that, that is such a good way of putting it. I love that. I agree. And also I, I do think there's a danger of I know that some people sort of said to me in the early days, like, oh, you know, if you're integrating the two, you're, you could be diluting such a pure lineage as the Tibetan medicinal one. And, you know, what do you think you're doing? And, and, and actually I've been saved from that because I'm thinking I'm doing what my spiritual teacher asked me to do. Right. <laughs> so, so I never felt insecure about it because I had that really clear directive. I mean, I don't think I ever did say to anybody, I'm doing what my spiritual teacher asked me to do, but in my head, I'm thinking, you know, I understand why people might say that. I really get it. And I think there is a danger of diluting things and kind of mixing it all together. And so if you, yeah, I love that idea of the two languages. Thank you for that. Well, I've been thinking about this a lot because because studying the different systems of astrology, which are very different. Another metaphor I like is painting. You know, you have oil paints, you have watercolors. You're not going to use the same techniques for both because there's an internal consistency to each system. But it the other thing is, so from my understanding, Tibetan medicine is already a synthesis of Ayurveda and Chinese medicine, and then also the native Tibetan. The Bon, yeah. The Bon tradition. So, well... <laughs> is that true? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it is. But I think that Tibetan medicine is Buddhist medicine. And that's perhaps, you know, 
an underlying right. thread or, or bigger than a thread, you know, a current. And I think, yes, there's definitely crossover with Ayurveda and and m many of the herbs from TCM are in the pharmacopoeia. And of course, you know, there's a lot of knowledge share and enriching. And with the traditional born system that's also integrated into it, you know, there's this fascinating teachings about spirit possession and appreciation of local land deities and how to read somebody's pulse when they're not present and all of that I love that side of it you know really really fascinating yeah and we have all of that interwoven in a very logical and beautiful way but the underlying thread is this you know this feeling or this teaching that until it's considered that in Tibetan medicine, no one can be truly, truly healthy and balanced until they accept that they are not separate from the outer environment in which they live. They have to, they have to really understand that interplay between themselves and the outside. And, you know, with, with my patients, look, I'm not going to go straight in with like, look, you know, you need to reach enlightenment to, to be well. But I just think it's a really wise teaching that there will always be an element of vulnerability to imbalance and illness until we kind of feel, you know, maybe we're not enlightened, but, you know, until we feel quite grounded and, and understand how the environment and ourselves is a sort of, it's a continuum, you know, and we are influenced by it. I think I always... I just think that's so wise. I th yeah, that's, I mean, I think it's especially important for Westerners who their fundamental perspective often is being a separate, isolated entity mm -hmm. that has, you know, has no interaction. I mean, there's the outside world doesn't influence me. I am my own you know, person. I influence I, it. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I influence it. It's a passive substrate for me to yeah. put my will, assert my will into. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, you know, we, it's even looking at in the in language of science, like we are not separate, like the environmental influences are always present and there's no way to, to really separate the air we breathe, the food we eat, everything is interconnected. So I think, and it, it's very, huh, you got to know that <laughs> if you want to heal, I, I would think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is, it is interesting, isn't it? And I find that that the other, that's the thing I suppose about herbalism is that when there's this kind of, I don't know if using the word alchemy is the right one for what I'm going to say, but there's this interplay between the practitioner, the patient and the herbs, right? And it's different every time because, because yeah, we are all interconnected. And so with some patients, you know, you can get onto these sort of discussions but with others, like they're not really going to be very comfortable with that. And we're going to keep everything at a really nice level of physiological healing but over time you know I mean I've got a patient I really love her you know but she she is an allopathic professional uh -huh. uh, yeah I, I do treat the odd GP hospital consultant and neurologists and anesthetists mid, mis, midwives and things not hordes let's get that in perspective but uh, the, you know it happens Anyway, this particular patient, she's very lovely. And there's always a good discussion when someone's from a sort of allopathic modality. But when we first started, I think, I think I've seen her about five or six times now, and we're kind of getting to know each other a lot more. But when she first started, it was very matter of fact, like, I want you to fix me. And that's all there is to it. <laughs> and last time she was here, I didn't even say anything to her. I did not talk about any of this stuff, but I did put Angelica in her prescription. Oh. <laughs> and, and last time she said, oh my God, I am just feeling so much more grounded. And I'm really thinking about, I'm starting to think things like, what is my destiny? I really want to fulfill my <laughs> destiny. I thought, oh, that was the Angelica. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> She's so happy. She's like listening to spiritual podcasts and things. And I, yeah, I promise you, I did not influence her in any way other than her prescription. Angelica might have influenced her. <laughs> I think I'm, I think it was the Angelica. 
Yeah, I mean, and it wasn't even really in there for that reason. It was just, it was definitely justified physiologically. But when she came in and kind of quite out of character started talking about finding her destiny and listening to spiritual podcasts, I thought, I think that's probably the Angelica. <laughs> that's so cool. I, I love hearing, you know, stories from your your practice. And I was I was actually wondering, like, we talk about treating people holistically as herbalists. And I was wondering what that means to you and what that looks like for you in your practice. Like, how do you incorporate your knowledge and incorporate the person and the herbs? Like, I would love to just hear you refine that a little bit. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> it's one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> but I think, well, I would preface it by saying that I think that in my practice and many herbal practices in the West, I think we are generally dealing with chronic conditions. I think, you know, the very different rules apply to acute conditions. So I know that there are some herbalists working in acute care mm -hmm. and my comments do not apply in that situation because if someone comes in and they've got like a serious wound, bleeding or something like that, you just got to treat them fix it you know that it's a completely different way of looking at it really That's a good um, point. but when you're dealing you know my patients are people who the the healthcare people may the, the allopathic people may not be able to help them anymore or they've not got the answers that they want so they're kind of like cases that have been going on for a really long time they've been through lots of investigations they're disheartened. They don't know if they're going to get better. They've also become quite accustomed to being ill. And sometimes that is part, that feels like part of their, almost like their personality that they've, that it's been with them for so long. It's hard for them to imagine a life when they're not an ill person, you know, so there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of layers that need to be unpicked. But my way of looking at it is that I think the human body is absolutely amazing at fixing itself. And the, but what we have to do is act as a detective to find out what are the things that are preventing this human body from getting itself back into balance, because it's far wiser than, you know, I could ever be. But I what I can do is pretty common sense, really, is find out by talking to them, and I do a two hour initial consultation, I ask people every single thing that they eat and drink as a general rule every day with timings. I ask them, you know, when they go to bed, when they get up, what hobbies they have, you know, what brings them joy. You know, I really want to get to know them. But the point at which I ask people about a typical day of everything they eat and drink in chronological order, it's very revealing. And, you know, you can get to a situation where, for example, I had a patient who had not slept properly for 20 years and she'd been prescribed sleeping pills from her doctor and, you know, they were not really working. She felt awful. She had no energy. She was in a terrible state. And when I went through her intake, when it came to the things that she ate and drank every day, she was drinking 20 cups of coffee a day. 20? You know, she had been prescribed sleeping pills. I'm not saying that was the only reason, by the way. There were other reasons. But just as a massive, nobody had ever asked her. And oh, yet wow. she'd been prescribed sleeping pills for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's hard isn't it for allopathic practitioners they don't have long they can't go into it in the depth that as a herbalist can but my I think my job I feel as a whole with a holistic approach is to find those areas which can be fixed and then oh, and support the patient with herbs as well but unless you're really trying to understand why something has happened I don't think it's going to be so easy to fix it, really, because the patient has to understand like, oh, maybe it's not a good, such a great idea to drink 20 cups of coffee. And by the way, no water ever. No, that's a real problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, and it's like so I when students ask me what what is your advice to somebody that's going to become a medical herbalist? What advice can you give them? What advice can you give me? 
And they, I think they ask that because they think that I'm going to say something like, learn your herbs thoroughly, you know. And, okay, yeah. <laughs> and I just say, have really good powers of persuasion. Mm. Because that example that I've given you, it, I, I, if I'd have just given her some sedative herbs, it was never going to work. And I don't do that because... I, I also feel quite strongly that I don't want people coming into my clinic and then going out and, and saying, well, I tried that and it didn't work. And I just want to clarify, it's not like a me thinking I don't want them to say that about me. It, right. I don't care about that. If they think that I'm rubbish, I honestly don't care. What I do care about is them thinking I tried herbal medicine and it didn't exactly. work. It's exactly. the herbs. I don't want the herbs to be disrespected by people who are taking them in a way that is never going to work. So as a sort of loyalty to them, I want them to have the best chance of doing their job. So if that means persuading someone to have, you know, fewer cups of coffee, to drink more water, maybe to give up certain foods for a short time, I will do that. And I'm famous for, in my drop-in clinic, I'm really famous for not giving people stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they come in and people say oh can I can I buy something for my acid reflux and I said well I'm afraid I, I I can't sell something like that without I know you know I need to know a bit more about what's going on and I asked them you know so what what are you eating and what are you drinking and if I think that that could be contributing to it you know or they're not having any water and I said well I think the first thing to do before I prescribe you any herbs would be for you to drink a proper amount of water and maybe have less alcohol and do that no I'm not going to change I'm not going to do anything yeah I think well I'm not going to sell you anything then <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> Totally. because it's false isn't it I mean you could say oh that's really mean that person's suffering but that's the difference between a chronic and acute. If somebody is an acute situation and they've got terrible heartburn, of course, like I'm going to give them something. But if it's like a chronic thing, why, why prescribe herbs in a way that they can't fulfill their destiny to help people? They've given themselves up as agents of healing and it's up to us to make sure that they have the best chance of making a difference. And that, to me, that's holistic care, because if you treat the root cause as best as you can, those herbs can make an incredible difference, life-changing. Absolutely. And speaking of the, you know, the respect of the herbs as individuals, you, you do write and talk a lot about how something happens when you harvest your own medicine and when you grow your own herbs and gather your own herbs. And that's a shift in perception from tools, from herbs as tools to herbs as individuals. And you're writing a whole book. You wrote a whole book about that actually coming up. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that shift in perception. Yeah. Yeah. I think it just, it really seeps into you because I think the first stage of it is that if you've grown a lot of calendula for example such a beautiful plant <laughs> and you know and you've picked all these lovely sunny flowers mm -hmm. and you've kind of you know sometimes when we're picking them we're quite sad aren't we because they, they you know they look so beautiful you're thinking like oh sorry but you're going to be medicine you know you're going to help people you kind of find yourself feeling like that about it and and you feel like they in a way they sort of offer themselves like yeah it's okay for you to table my flowers because you're going to really you know put them to to such a great way of helping people it's really going to be amazing so so anyway so you you pick all these calendula flowers and you lay them out and you dry them and after you've done all of that are you really going to prescribe them to someone that's sort of saying well I'm not gonna I'm not gonna change my life I just want to take the herbs just sell me the herbs I'll pay you the money and let me see if it fixes my you know whatever it is you you sort of care don't you you've built yeah. that relationship with them whether or not you went into it with those sort of ideals of like, oh, you know, I'm going to 
grow these herbs for that reason just on a really practical level you've put all that effort into it you don't want them to be wasted right and mm -hmm. then I just think it gets under your skin and the more that you do it you you feel like hang on there's a bigger issue going on here because herbal medicine is such a huge industry you know there's so many supplements and there's the risk of some herbs being over harvested like slippery elm for example and different things golden seal you know there are people out there who just take golden seal every day because it manages their you know gut overgrowth and things like that and it's just it's just not okay is it like if we just respected the herbs as individuals and made sure that they were prescribed as best as we can you know like as far as possible prescribe them in ways that they can make a difference and not be wasted then that's going to be more sustainable, I think. I mean, I, I've actually got, I've got a patient who, he, she's not actually a patient now, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> she, she's an amazing lady, and she actually got a taxi to come and see me that it, because she, she didn't drive, and, and it's not, yeah, I guess you could get here on the, you could get here on the train, but you know, where she lived, she had to get a taxi that was approximately an hour's journey. So mm. she would pay for this taxi an hour, come here, have her consultation, and then, you know, pay the what pay with the guy while he waited. And then, you know, so she was really committed to coming. She spent a lot of resources getting here and she had acid reflux. And I went through her case and it turned out that, you know, she snacked on cheese a lot of the time and she I haven't got like a massive issue about cheese but you know she had other she had some symptoms to suggest that her digestion wasn't coping with it very well so I suggested that she cut that out and she also would have like wine every night before she went to bed you know there were a few kind of things that I was thinking like let's change that if you've got acid reflux let's mm -hmm. change some of those things and help heal it and, and obviously as well, part of that was supporting her digestion because acid reflux, you know, you need to kind of gently increase the digestion as well so that it, it doesn't sit in your stomach for so long. I mean, that's the whole topic. So I, so I got, you know, I sort of said, look, do this, you know, drink chamomile tea to help boost your, the bitter intake, but it's also nice and calming. And I'm mm. going to give you some slippery elm pills to help you in the short term while you make these changes and so she came back you know all in her taxi for an hour and she came back again and she'd been taking the slippery elm and she said oh I feel so much better I haven't had any acid reflux over the last month and I'm really delighted so I said oh that's great so let's carry on with it for another month and then we'll start reducing it because you won't need it anymore so she had it again for the next month and she'd always given me the impression that she'd been taking my advice. <laughs> but when it came to like after a few, she kept saying, oh no, I don't want to reduce. Whenever I try to reduce the pills, it comes back again. So I was just being like, oh, she's quite old and you know, she's very nice and she's coming in the taxi all this way. I don't want to be too harsh on her. So, you know, I said, well, yeah, we, but you know, honestly, it's not really that sustainable for me to keep giving it to you if it's not working. So, you know, and it turned out that she loved having the slippery elm because she could still have her wine. She could still have her all her cheesy snacks before bed. And she hadn't actually felt the need to change any of it because she was just taking my pills. So I said, oh. look, that's not OK, because it's a scarce herb it's endangered and you're what you're thinking is that I could just carry on supplying you with these pills for the rest of your life so that you can carry on doing what you want and she went yeah exactly what I think and which that's how people think when it's an allopathic drug isn't it like that's in our nature to expect well I'm paying this person I'm paying for a taxi I want their pills they should surely be grateful for my business and sell it to me but I just said no I'm sorry I can't do that so unless you're prepared to at least start to change your lifestyle I just can't supply you anymore and so she and I parted company wow yes <laughs> but I did I didn't sort of just sack her straight away I gave her the opportunity but it didn't feel like to me that does not feel like I'm serving the herbs to, to enter into that kind of 
relationship because once you've started that like do you in in five years time suddenly say to her like no sorry I like you can't you've started it off haven't you you can't let someone down but I think that at that beginning when I still had that it was still malleable enough for me to explain look this is the deal like you get yourself better and you know maybe maybe you'll only need them for occasional times when you've you know been out with your friends or something but you shouldn't be having to take them every single day just so that you can carry on with something that's making you ill so I'm not you know to me bigger than than my sales of something I'm not you know that's not my primary kind of motivation I suppose and and at the beginning when I was first qualified when I'd done all my you know studying Tibetan medicine and then studying Western herb Western herbal medicine and opening my clinic I was so excited and I thought you know I'm gonna finally be using herbs to help people get better mm -hmm. and after about a year or so that didn't feel the right way to describe it for me I mean language is very powerful so I started to think oh okay um using I know lots of people say it it is in our language but to me it feels a bit more exploitative in a way so I started to sort of try and think oh this is me I'm now work you know I'm working with them to help people get better but after you know now I actually feel like I'm working for them I'm I'm matching them with the people that need them <laughs> yes I love that progression Your mat ma herbal matchmaker yep. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so can I ask you a couple like practical questions about your practice so you're you know a self-sufficient herbalist you're growing or making your own medicine out of things that you gather how do you balance like the quantities and like the herbs that you have versus like the clients how many clients do you have that you can support you know I'm just mm. curious about that yeah. So recently I've really, I was seeing a lot more patients than I do right now. I mean, I'm still full time and I'm still very busy, but I was squeezing in lots of people and it was just such a lot, you know, and I wasn't allocating any specific time for my growing. My growing was like my relaxation time. So it would be at the weekends or in the evenings and I just reached a point I suppose I think writing this recent book uh, kind of made me realize like hang on you know you, you're not you might think you're a superwoman but you're not you know so so I have made a bit more space so that I can just really have at least a day a week just growing and making medicines and and being I think the other part of that is having alone time with the herbs because otherwise you know if you're if you're always teaching or you're always seeing patients you don't you just don't get that time to just be with your own reflections you know and yeah I mean I I absolutely love people or I wouldn't be in this job but I also really love my own company <laughs> 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 well no but I like just being calm and being with herbs so so I I think so that's part of it and I think in terms of the amounts if you are prescribing in this holistic way mm -hmm. your need for quantities of herbs goes down because people are getting better and they don't need it anymore so if I had lots of people like the patient I was talking about, you know, I'd be churning out making capsules all day long yeah. to sell them to all these people that had become reliant on them. And I'm very, really firm on, I don't want to create dependence. I want people to get better. And I'm so happy when people get better. So, yeah, so I think it's difficult, isn't it? Sometimes there's going to be bigger quantities, but than others and you never know which herbs are going to be needed but what I do on a kind of practical level if that's if that's what you really want to get to is that I I harvest my herbs and dry them in a way that they are so good quality because they're small batch dried and they will then last for well over a year like two years three years so in, in my herb store at the back, which is all dark and the herbs are stored in tight boxes, food grades boxes, 
and they some of them you know the roots and things were might sometimes be four years old and they're really fine you know really that that angelica for example i know that's gonna last you can tell straight away if something's still vibrant Absolutely. So the fact that things have a much longer shelf life so aerial parts like say agrimony that's definitely good for two years definitely mm -hmm. i would never just throw it away oh it's a year old it needs to be thrown away i will check you know mm -hmm. And that means you have a lot more leeway. So if every year I make a harvest of something, so at the moment, lime blossom, linden. Oh. I, last year I went crazy harvesting. There was a really big crop mm -hmm. and I, I had the time and it was the right time. Sometimes I don't, sometimes the weather's wet. So I, I gathered a lot and I've, as it happens, I haven't prescribed too much of it, you know, so I've still got plenty. So this year I'll, I'll probably just only make a, a little harvest just for, you know, to take a photo and, you know, enjoy it. But <laughs> yeah. you can, you can kind of vary what you do. And then there is other things like, for example, what was I doing the other day? There was something that I was really freaking out because I was really low on. I think, well, cat mint, I was really low on. And, and, and so I was like, oh, I'm going to have to harvest quite a lot of that. And it's just it's just like a kind of movable feast of what you need, what you don't need. And sometimes it doesn't work out. And sometimes I have to buy stuff, you know, mm -hmm. but I try not to. And it generally works out. And it's so often a oh, hawthorn blossom. <laughs> I was down to the last double handful in my store and I was really because I have a lot of people taking hawthorn capsules and that actually is is the exception to my stringent sort of rule about not you know I'm not going to supply people with capsules there are people that I supply with hawthorn capsules because it's keeping them alive and yeah. I, I'm okay about that because that yeah. is doing a great <laughs> job and it's appreciated you know I've got mm -hmm. a patient with chronic heart congestive heart failure Mm -hmm. And he came to me when he he'd been given 18 months to live and he came to me with the objective of staying alive a bit longer. Mm -hmm. And that was about five years ago. And oh, he's oh. doing all right. But I'm not going to say to him, I'm not giving you your hawthorn. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this double handful left of dried blossoms. I was like, oh, is it going to be OK? And then it's always seems to be OK. You know, the flowers just come out at the right time and and it is like stock control as well you're sort of thinking you know yeah. make sure I, I maybe next year I need to gather a bit more because it was a bit tight <laughs> totally yes but you learn what you need you learn yeah yeah similar last year we didn't have a great hawthorn harvest we actually had covid during the hawthorn bloom and oh, for you want to do that and this year, the Hawthorne is just magnificent. It's coming in so beautifully. We already made some Hawthorne flower tincture. I'm going to gather more to try. So it's fantastic. Yeah. I think, you know, if I can, I try to harvest a bit more than I need so that I have that buffer. Yeah. Because then the following year, rather than waste it, the following year, I'll think, no, I, I'll just harvest less. Mm -hmm. But you just always have that little bit extra to play with if you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you dry your herbs to keep the potent potency so well? It starts with the harvesting. <laughs> yeah. So the, the first thing that affects potency is, apart from obviously growing the herbs beautifully, which I'm sure you do, <laughs> but, you know, as soon as you pick them, they start to deteriorate. And so the other thing that happens is if they are bruised, they will lose some of their qualities. There will be a lesser quality. So what I do is I try to lay the herbs out in a single-ish layer mm -hmm. within 30 minutes to an hour of picking mm -hmm. and try to handle them gently. You know, So for example, if you're taking mint, leaves off a stalk I've seen people do that with a colander like pulling yeah. that I've seen that that uh -huh. bruises them so yeah. you're using far more aromatics mm -hmm. and I mean look you know I'm I'm a bit 
bit of a fuss pot about it because I, really, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've seen the difference. I've actually, I didn't really realize how much of a difference there was in a way because I've, I don't buy in stuff much these right. days, so I don't compare it. But I had a group of herbalists that came and we had a bit of a gathering and I passed around. Somebody said something like, oh, can we see what your dried herbs are like? And I will answer, you want to know how I dry them, but I'm still on that. <laughs> but I passed around this peppermint box and they were, these were herbalists who work with herbs every day. And they, they were smelling this peppermint and they're like, this is incredible. And I think like, that it must be really different from bought in peppermint for their reaction to be like that. Yeah. Some of the things like a cramp bark. It yeah. is just so different when you harvest it yourself. But we're still on to how to do it. So the first thing is to not leave them in a basket turning to compost. Right. Like straight away, lay them out, let them breathe and do it gently. And if you need, to, you know, try to just snip them off the stem instead of, you know, do that. I mean, I do do that with rosemary, to be fair, because it's a bit tougher. But yeah. <laughs> that when it's dry, more like dry them off. Yeah, you can when it's dry, you can you can go for it exactly. So so I lay them out and then I use a series of dehydrators. I just have like domestic ones. I, I actually use the Lay Kip Filter Pro and I'm not on any kickback. So <laughs> but I I've got <clears throat> I've sort of got into using that one because I have loads of spare trays from ones that wore out in the past and I kept the tray so I've got all this system where I can lay stuff out and yeah. then just put the into the onto the dehydrator when it's ready and it's just you know I have mm -hmm. loads of those trays so it, it yeah. would it makes sense for me to have this same system yeah. that's really cool it really works well and and the other thing is people often say to me oh but you know why why do I need to get a dehydrator? And I would say, you don't, <laughs> you know, you don't necessarily need to have a dehydrator, but here, especially in the UK, you know, it is quite high humidity, right. um, dry things passively up to a certain point, but that, but you probably need to finish them off yeah. so that you can put them into storage. And the other thing is that if you're, if you have loads of space available to you, you could have trays everywhere and stuff could really dry. But here I've only got a small <laughs> clinic and it just gets covered in trays. So I need to get them into the dehydrator just to make space for the next crop. So for me, the dehydrators are really helpful in a high humidity environment, but I'm not saying they are essential for everyone. If you if you live somewhere with plenty of space and you've got a dry, low humidity environment, go for it, you know do it passively it's fine yeah also one of the things that i've got on my list <laughs> a solar dehydrator we <laughs> but you know it takes a little bit of building expertise to make one but they, you can do it you know without electricity but we use the the de, the regular electric dehydrators right now mostly yeah, to, to crisp them up laying everything out and then crisping it and doing a little finish off in there yeah <laughs> yeah I think it's really because there's nothing worse than putting something into this into storage oh. and then it, you find like oh no it's gone like it's just so gutting so to sad. It. <laughs> totally. oh it doesn't happen very often but when it does I just feel so guilty yeah, yeah. I know me too yeah <laughs> it's happened, happened to me before yeah started doing like smaller batches too of storage rather than like saying like last week I have a big bag of calendula I did and then this week I add my calendula to that same bag to top it off now I just do like separate batches too oh. because every once in a while you can ruin the ones that you did last yeah. week perfectly so yeah. well I I have a bit of a system now because I agree, like, especially with calendula, it's really mm. difficult to know that it's properly dry because of those green calices and they're just waiting so to yeah. Yeah, reabsorb moisture or to spread their moisture out. But what I do is I have a lot of small boxes. So I have quarantine boxes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and I and so I'll harvest the the next batch of calendula and dry it and think that it's fine, but it stays in its separate box for about a month, and then if all is well, it can go into the big box because otherwise you just got millions of boxes. 
Totally. That's so smart. <laughs> the quarantine box is <laughs> perfect solution to that. <laughs> There's one plant that we can't really grow out here that I've seen you write about before, and it's the European mistletoe. And I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about that and about the uses and lore and things like that. Definitely. I I absolutely love mistletoe. And I'm so lucky living in Somerset because there is a lot of European mistletoe around. So this is, um, just to make sure we don't get confused, this is Viscum album. Uh, and it's not, I have, I've written a little note so I don't get the Latin name wrong. Forodendron leucarpum <laughs> is the American mistletoe and that's not okay. Um, it's toxic, my understanding is, although I don't think I've ever actually seen any in real life. Um, well, that's the only one I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> the south, you'll find it a lot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but here in Somerset, there are all these... Um, it's just like a complete globe in the winter. You've got these leafless trees and there's these green globes. And you can really understand how um, druids and, and people would see this in the middle of winter on these deciduous trees, that these living globes that are off the ground. I mean, of course it's magical, isn't it? I mean, how amazing is that? And um, yeah, so the, um, the Latin name Viscum means sticky like viscous and uh, mistletoe was believed to be the berries were believed to be drops of semen from the cosmic bull when it was impregnating the goddess the earth goddess (laughs) so um definitely to do with fertility but in um in my practice i work with mistletoe mostly um as a sedative and a hypotensive and to help people sleep you know if they're not sleeping well um and it really is great but I just would love to share with you this um, amazing little thing about the berries yes. <laughs> on the magical level mm-hmm. so um if you it's actually not really fair for you guys because you you won't be able to see a berry <laughs> in real life <laughs> but uh, on the European mistletoe berry there's a white berry and at the base, there's like a little black dot and it has four semicircles around the dot. So kind of like equidistant and there's this little dot in the middle. And um, the dot in the center, um, re- well, let me just get this right. The whole, yeah, the dot in the center is like the all encompassing whole. And the the four uh, semicircles around it are to, they represent the mystical cities of the fairy kingdom, which is called Sidhe, which is Mm S-I-D-H-E. And I just love this. And um, basically the northern semicircle is to represent the city of Phalias, and the southern is Phineas, and the western is Murias, and the east is Gorias. And I just think um, it's just to me, it's like a mandala, you know, that there's this idea of the different directions being different um, characters. And I'm afraid I don't know more about these cities. There's probably people listening that will know more about it. But I just love these traditions. And it's just so magical to think that we've got this mandala in the berry of a very sacred plant that grows between earth and air and oh just love it and last um well just before uh christmas at the end of last year i was going on a walk in an area that i hadn't walked in before Mm -hmm. and i was following a river and i came around a bend and there's this hawthorn tree with a mass of mistletoe that was at eye level. And usually, you know, you're kind of looking up and you're thinking, oh, I got to wait till there's a storm or something um, before I can see it. But this one, I could just sit with it and it was just right there. I didn't need to actually pick any, I didn't ask it because I had loads that had come down in a storm. So my stocks of European mistletoe are really (laughs) good. But just to be able to sit there and and look at the berries and look at the plant, it was totally magical. (laughs) On a hawthorn. 
Yes, and and on a Hawthorne, no less. You exactly. Know. <laughs> it was just a great, a great hangout. <laughs> That's so special. Sometimes we follow these paths right to where we need to be to see this amazing, you know, gift of nature. Totally. That's so cool. Thank you so much for telling us about mistletoe. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I would love to hear too about your new book, Working Herbal Dispensary. So you have 108 herbs in this book. What else have you included in it? And how do you choose those 108 herbs? Just yeah, tell us about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wanted to, the, the rationale for writing the book, I suppose, was that when I was studying Western herbal medicine, I'm quite, I like to have things, it may not sound like it, but I do like to have things kind of organized, especially when I'm learning. And I decided when I was learning Materia Medica that I was going to make flashcards and, you know, and they were going to have like color coded edges for like all the diuretics were going to be one color and all the nervines were going to be another color and I was and I had great fun making all these flashcards and drawing a little drawing of the herb and writing their key actions and stuff and to, but I soon realized that my system was deeply flawed because there's <laughs> just not easy to say yeah that's a diuretic that's a nervine, that's a digestive. And it was just not tidy. And I was like, oh no, I've got to put a purple edge and a yellow edge and a blue edge. <laughs> I couldn't make it tidy and just learn about it. And then I realized that that's the whole point. You know, you can't do that with herbs. You can I sort do. of learn about them in that way to start with, but you realize like, no, they, they cannot be put in a box. You can't do that. You really need to kind of just get to know them. And that takes a long time. And, and so I felt the other thing that I noticed is that there is a bit of a tendency for people when they're learning about herbs to view them in terms of like the constituents they contain and the conditions that they treat. And right. I understand that, like, yeah, look, that's an important step in learning about them but whenever people ask me on Instagram you know if I do a photo of something and they say oh well how do you use it well that that is a question that just brain meltdown because I'm thinking like <laughs> yeah it's a perfectly reasonable question you know yes how do you use it I really get that you want to know you know but but I'm thinking well I I don't want to make a simple one-liner you know like it's good for cystitis because that would disrespect the herb <laughs> you know I need to write a whole massive essay about it and also it's not as simple as that if I did say yeah treat cystitis you're thinking well that it's it's not all it is it's like if would you say about your best friend it's like yeah she's blonde <laughs> you, know, like, you wouldn't would you you know so so anyway I, I I wrapped my tied myself in knots about you know how was I gonna get around this and I thought well I think the best thing to do is to actually write about them in a way that hopefully brings together their character and it still talks about you know the conditions they're good for and some of them you know I don't hugely talk about the constituents but it, obviously it's part of it um, but I also talk about yeah their physiological properties and and each herb that I talk about I try to have like a a phrase that helps you really get to the heart of it so for example I'm I'm you know do you know what I haven't even got a copy of my book because it's I haven't seen one yet so I'm just doing this from memory and it might not be it might not be the exact words I use but I think so with cramp bark at the top I have like you know uh, cramp bark viburnumopolis and then underneath that there's like the key phrase to help you remember it mm -hmm. and it's cramp bark is the master of letting go mm -hmm. And the reason, so that's encompassing, you know, obviously it's got all of its physiological aspects of helping to relieve spasm and, you know, and, and helping with high blood pressure because even the cardiovascular system, it can help it to relax, but also on an energetic level, you know, when people are really quite rigid mm -hmm. in their attitudes and they have a very strict regime, you know, cramp bark can really make a, 
an astounding difference. I had a, a lady that when I was doing her consultation, I asked her about her food and she said, well, on Mondays we have this, on Tuesdays this, like, and it was really everything about her life was very rigid and the same mm -hmm. and she had high blood pressure. And I was thinking to myself, to myself well, I don't know about the other herbs, but she's definitely having viburnum mopulus a cramp bar, <laughs> and that's for sure. And over the months, as her blood pressure came down, she got a bit more flexible. And, and I knew that, I just knew the cramp bark had been really effective. The blood pressure was, it was so lovely to see her blossoming and her blood pressure coming down. And then she came in, and this is a lady in her mid seventies. And she told me, I never mentioned this to you, but I always wanted to be a racing driver. And so I've booked an experience day at the local racetrack so that I can have a go. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Cramp bark to the rescue. But anyway, so so it's kind of like describing the herbs and also the magical aspects okay. sometimes. And and I think as well, I think it is quite revealing to for me to be able to describe a few case studies that show mm -hmm. about the herbs working on different levels at the same time and and I think I really wanted to include recipes so that if people are really keen on herbs but they're not like in a in a qualified sort of or whatever you want to call it like a professional setting mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it's herbs are for everyone so I've actually included all these recipes for the home apothecary so that people can build their own apothecary and understand how they can prescribe these for their family and for themselves and yeah it was it was really fun but I I actually I always have to work in 108 because it's a Tibetan sacred number oh I just think cool. like yeah so my first book had 108 herbs in the oh. glossary about how to dry them. And then the second book, I was thinking like, oh, 108 is an awful lot to write about in that degree of detail. So maybe, you know, maybe I should do 54 and then like later on, you know, do that. Because I was thinking, honestly, it's a lot to write about. And I said to my husband, like, yeah, I think I'm, I just think 108, although I like, it really appeals to me to, be, to do 108. Maybe I should just do 54 because it's just going to be such a huge project otherwise. And he said, God, possibly just do 54. It would be really rubbish to only do 54. <laughs> <laughs> because like, why should I have to buy volume two? He said, you must do 108. <laughs> You must. And I'll tell you, there were times during when I wrote that where I was really cursing him. <laughs> but he's right, right? Do the full he's month. absolutely right. And I'm so grateful because I pushed on through. Yeah. And it, even then, even though I'm sort of slightly saying, you know, it was a huge undertaking, it was so difficult to choose the hundred. <laughs> it's like, who's going to make it into the final cut, you know? Yeah. But in the end, I think, I think I had to choose perhaps the 108 that I felt that I knew for me, I knew the best. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the other thing. Like I was quite in some respects, a little bit, you know, I was quite nervous about writing it in a way because my experience of herbs is going to be different from other people's. And I didn't want to come across as like, yeah, this is what this one does. And this is how you should look at it. It's more like, I want it to be like, look, this is this is my understanding of this herb and I hope that it helps give some food for thought and you know maybe some inspiration or maybe it's not you know it, like people are going to work in different ways aren't they so it's kind of like just a sharing of how I view them and yeah and I'm sure that there's a lot of commonalities with what other people view but also you know we are when we work with a herb it is very personal isn't it Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, I think yeah, it was it it was quite a relief when I finished it, I can tell you. And it's going to be amazing when I actually see a copy if I can see it's real. I'm so excited for you. I, I saw that Ollie from Aeon Books sent you a picture of the <laughs> copy on Instagram and I was so excited for you. So, <laughs> and, yeah, it's real. It's just I haven't felt it yet. Yeah, I think I'm going to get my copy at the same time as everyone else. So, okay, 
Cool. Yeah, we're cool. getting into. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if folks want to order your book or they want to find you, you know, online, you have Instagram and Patreon. Do you want to tell folks how they can get in touch and how they can pre-order or order? Yeah. Yeah. So the best thing to do, well, firstly, I'm on Instagram as at Mirobolan Clinic. And I'm also on there as at Lucy Jones Herbal with underscores between them. And in my bio, in both of those, there is a link to order from Eon. Um, And at the moment, there is a discount code that you can use. And I think it's very imminent. I don't know if that's still going to be going by the time this comes out. So I don't want to disappoint people. (laughs) But, But anyway, but yeah, so go on the links or you can order directly from Eon. And if you are in different countries, obviously lots of people in the US, there is a US distributor, but I'm not sure of the details of that because there's a new distributor coming on in the US. So I will share in my bio on Instagram. Sorry to be a bit vague, but I sort of just let let Eon do, deal with all of, all of that side of it. Mm-hmm. And I also do have a Patreon, mm-hmm. which is linked in my bios on there as well. And it's so much fun to have a, an online community. I set it up when it was when it was the pandemic, and I was a bit worried that nobody was going to come to my clinic anymore, and I was going to like, oh no, what am I going to do? And so I set up the Patreon because so many people also ask if they can come and study with me. So I thought, well, this is perfect oh. to be online, and it's just become so much more than that. It's like a family, and. Oh. It's just so fun. And we have Q and A's and like, I learn so much from my, from my patrons. Yes, <laughs> and it's yes. just nice because it can be a bit isolating working mm-hmm. alone. And then I have my, like every three weeks or so, we all have a get together and I just so look forward to it. It's brilliant. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. like, people, It's not just for my benefit. I mean, people do say they enjoy it as well. <laughs> well, yeah, of course they do. <laughs> so <Yeah>. cool. <laughs> Any other things that you're excited about or yeah, what, what's coming up for you? What are you? No, but well, at the moment, I am doing quite a few talks and conferences and things. Nice. And, and, and yeah, I have got other things bubbling up, but I'm not quite ready to, I'm going to be a bit mysterious about that. Oh, um, but yeah, oh, and, and though there is a lot of people who were asking me to, do another tier on patreon so i had like the self-sufficient herbal tier where we talk about growing and gathering and drying and stuff like that and then there's the pro tier for people that are actually seeing patients because there's a whole another layer of issues it's, and yeah. uh, it's quite handy to talk about like you know what do you do if people are late paying or what do you do you know like all that sort of practical thing about running a practice and i really wanted to have this kind of like a a layer that or a tier that's like for the home herbalist so we could talk about what conditions we you know how we can treat them and all that kind of thing and I've been meaning to do that for a long time but I've realized there's a few it's it's not the best platform in my view for sharing that kind of info I think and so I thought actually I want to do it properly to do the herbs justice (laughs) Um, and to not get lured into that trap of talking about this is what you use for this condition you know so I'm actually creating a home herbalists course that I will be launching and I was trying to launch it kind of around about before the end of this year but honestly with writing about these 108 herbs yeah <laughs> I, I need to take a bit of a break thanks to my that husband's input <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of just taking it a bit easy but that will be something that that comes that's out awesome. in well, that's the- so exciting I bet so many of our listeners would love to study with you and to learn more about that cool oh, it's it's lovely interacting with people we, we all learn so much from each other don't we absolutely yeah and it's so cool with the internet that we can have this global community of people from all over who are on similar wave, wavelengths with the yeah. love for you know <laughs> it's great <laughs> well thank you so much lucy this has been so fantastic i really appreciate you joining us on the podcast and thanks for all of your stories and wisdom thank you so much for having me it's such a pleasure <laughs>
it's been super fun.